How does that fundamentally change all of the thinking around Washington from, hey, I've got a switch and I've got a wire and I've got a house and I know where the tax address is? It changes it completely. And there were no answers, but they were very curious. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> well, they, they did warn us. They, they said, listen, there's a huge amount of stuff coming and you guys need to be in Washington. And I looked at him and I looked around the room with the rest of the four executives on our team and I said, which one of us has to go? <laughs> uh, and the message there was what I experienced. Um, I mentioned to you the CLEC in 1996 Telecom Act enabled um, loop sharing. And the, uh, the big, the CLEX were all trying to go figure out how to make a business out of this. At the same time, you had all the LEX uh, incumbents hiring uh, big powered folks to go and bang on the FCC to reverse that decision. And we saw it coming and it was, it just turned into a, um, a battle of wills and I think the CLEX lost out on that one. Uh, and so the, the FCC was arguing in our little office is that be wary, the, um, the big guys are coming with big dollars and, and you need to be in Washington for this uh, alongside of Google and others. Yeah, let me, let me um, just pick up on that point. Um, it, you know, we would like things to be simpler. I would like the tax code to be a heck of a lot simpler. Yay. Um, but, but there's a lot of people that benefit from the complexity in the tax code. There's a lot of people a lot of companies that benefit from the complexity and the structure of the way the Communications Act is, is, is formulated right now. So, you know, if you don't like it, unfortunately, that's, that's the system. You can either try to rationalize it um, or you can try to make sure that the, the rules that impact your space are, are, um, are, are, are rational. But, you know, it's not going to go away anytime soon, unfortunately. Now, quick, let me ask you the, the really hard question, right? We had some questions yesterday about uh, developers saying, we'd like to work with you, but we need an API. Now, the issue is networks are really hard to segment that way. I don't know what the API is to the AT&T network. Uh, have you got thoughts about how you see that interface, how you see working with people in terms of APIs? And it's a hard question because it's a little bit like Avaya saying, we want you to open up location information to all our PBXs, and people might say, huh? I don't understand that. And if I'm a smart carrier executive, I'm saying, we'll be glad to give you that information. The priceless is here. Are you willing to pay the priceless? Or is there some other way that, again, ecosystems work when both parties make money? I mean, that's the bottom line here. And, and nobody wants to increase their operating costs. You certainly don't. But nothing works unless there's two parties to any transaction, right? And that's one of the things we're trying to get at is, so how do we get those transactions talked about and moving? Uh, right. So. Um not exactly sure the first part of your question, which I think was the nut of the question about carrier. Uh, no, basically, the, you know, it, it, the hard question is simply, if I'm a carrier, I've got to ask you, what's in it for me working okay. with Ribbit? Uh, so um, the way the carriers work today is you go get the, the wholesale department and you sign a contract and you agree to buy zillions of minutes and you negotiate a price on it. And then you put in a cross-connect and interconnect and then we put traffic on their network. Uh, so today it's pretty simple as, as we get started. What, there's a couple of interesting opportunities that at least I have in my head and, and we'll see how this bears out. Uh, platform and API is a huge conversation in every carrier in the globe. Um, we've, we've talked with most of them um, because they're all trying to kind of figure out how, do they, how are they going to innovate past simple dial tone. Um, and we're offering a, a solution to do that. And there's the question that you're asking is, what's the economic stack? So you've got all the transport origination termination costs down here at the bottom. You have somebody paying um, a high value product. We, we introduced Ribbit for Salesforce. Salesforce costs 80 to $130 per subscriber per month just, just to have Salesforce. And uh, those subscribers are now paying somewhere around $40 a month to get the Ribbit added on. So the carriers look at that and say, oh my gosh, you've gotten a $40 ARPU on something that is so um, you know, low density in terms of the minutes of use that you're getting. They really want to see how they can do that. The only reason why that worked is because the API allowed a very specific implementation of voice in a very specific market. And, and the whole idea is that if the carriers can do this for themselves, if they can enable all kinds of developers around the globe across all kinds of horizontal and vertical markets, to em embed voice or telephony or messaging services, um, then the carriers can extract new revenue streams that they don't have today. So that's at the top layer. And then somewhere in the middle, Gary, is your question is how does that, how does that get broken up? Um, is there a, an API middle layer where it's transaction-based? Does it get uh, 
rolled into the cost of a minute. Uh, there's another company here at the show, uh, Jaduka or, or Network IP. They're rolling their cost into the minutes of use. Um, so the models are, are not well defined yet because we're all very early in the marketplace. Um, but what I can tell you is that in the next five to ten years, we're going to see uh, all the major carriers doing something like this. British Telecom is the first one. They're, they're probably our, our biggest competitor out there in terms of Air API. That's, that's a very interesting comment to be making. It is. <laughs> Bill. Just, uh, I mean, I think, you know, competition is how you get access to, to this, this stack. Um, you know, there was this thing that the FCC created many years ago is called open network architecture. It was supposed to be you know, the ability to tie into the switch and create features and it just was, it never, it never went anywhere. Um, but, you know, if it, I mean, the competition with alternate operating systems, I mean, that creates a, a desire to create these features and subsets. The, the competition that you're delivering at the feature set level, um, the competition that the 96 Telecom Act introduced where we had competitive local exchange carriers. I mean, I remember, I mean, way back in the day, it was, it was illegal to provide a competitive local service. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they broke that up, they created shared tenant service providers so you could provide competitive services only to a building or conjoined buildings. I mean, you know, we think of that today and say, my, how could that possibly be? So, you know, wireless competition, the 700 megahertz, um, uh, you know, what, what uh, additional competition I think is gonna, cr is gonna create that access to that feature set, uh, I think. I, it's not going to be the regulators in Washington. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, you know, we look forward, and one of the reasons why we, I said five to ten years is because we're going to end up with uh, a greater overlay of wireless IP networks, and those networks are going to be able to deploy and carry voice. We just heard Ferrari talking about uh, voice peering fabric. Um, that's just the beginning, and there are going to be probably many of those networks um, as addressing endpoints not, are no longer uh, class five switch termination endpoints with a, a dial plan, but they're going to be addressing schemes in an enum database. Uh, so the carriers are going, they, they understand this, I believe they fully in their, their heart of hearts really know that this is coming and they're trying to figure out how to migrate over the next five to ten years and um, you know, right now they're, they're buying very expensive service delivery platforms and, and very expensive uh, IMS architectures uh, and I think some of them are finding that, that um, there's nimbler ways, perhaps, to approach this. Also, by the way, if you have questions, grab, raise your hand, grab the mic. Otherwise, I'll have to keep going. You, one, Gary, one, one yeah. other interesting thing. I mean, um, you've seen this in, in, the, in the voice over IP debate uh, where, you know, rural carriers, um, mm -hmm. there are many of them that are, are, you know, saying, hey, we'd like you to continue to pay us these very inflated access rates for terminating services. There are other providers out there that are saying, hey, if you can't beat them, join them. Let's create our own service. Let's expand outside of our territory because mm -hmm. these, exactly. these services and features allow us to immediately expand our, our market opportunity. So if, you know, if I were a rural telco out there or a rural wireless operator, I'd say, let me go into the feature business. Let me, let me create access to all these features. Let me expand my market because I don't actually need to you know, build out a facility. Um, being a, become an attacker rather than a defender, and that's very difficult to do it. But if some of them have done it, and they're and they're actually prospering. So for those of you that are looking to get access to some of these features, you can't get them from a, a major carrier. I'd say you know talk to some of the talk to some of these 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 rural carriers. You don't think of them as competitors because they're they're geographically limited, but they're they you know they do have access to interconnection. They do have roaming rights, uh, and they can they can provide these uh, capabilities. Yeah, one of the things that's sort of interesting, aside from having come out of the cable industry, I also was part of a startup, uh, CLEC. So I sort of understand the CLEC point of view of looking at the world. And one of the things that it turns out in retrospect after burning through billions of dollars, wastefully, uh, we discovered was one of the problems with the way we were approaching the market was we were going to approach it as same set of services, equivalent quality, lower price. And it's logical. Everyone always does that. That doesn't work. It doesn't work because in, in, in truth, the incumbents will simply lower their prices to match yours and you die, right? So one of the things that is really attractive to me about open networks and open platforms is for the first time, uh, you don't have a situation where I buy a Nortel and my feature set is what Nortel gives me. I don't buy a Lucent 5E, and my feature set is what Lucent gives me. I don't buy whatever device it is, and I have what all the rest of you have because it's the same stuff. <laughs>